Okay, uh, welcome to our uh, first Zoom lecture uh, for 68528. And the topic of this lecture and the next couple of lectures is going to be network security. Uh, and this is a large uh, topic. And so uh, this is one reason we're going to spend uh, multiple uh, lectures uh, on it. Uh, but even just the, the talk of today or the lecture of today um, is going to be uh, covering a lot of ground. Um, and so let me you know, introduce you a little bit to the topic. Um, so when we think about uh, network security, uh, you know, think of the cloud. The cloud has you know, the internet, uh, it has you know, servers connected to it, has clients connected to it. And there are going to be a number of topics that are going to be of great interest to us, namely uh, authentication. You know, how does the client authenticate itself to the server so that the server knows which client actually is talking to it? And similarly, the, uh, the, the reverse of that, you know, how does the server authenticate to the client so that the client knows, for example, it actually is really talking to the legit you know, Amazon.com. Second topic is going to be confidentiality, you know, ensuring that the communication between the client and server is encrypted in a way that, you know, attacker can actually not um, uh, decrypt it. Um, most of the topic today, though, actually is going to be, you know, focused on the core of the network and not so much on the end nodes. And what we'll see is that the core of the network is actually mostly concerned with liveness. Um, and uh, the issues of authentication and confidentiality actually are pushed, you know, to the end nodes uh, in higher level protocols. And you know, let me uh, to make that to make that uh, to explain why you know that is uh, the case or why this actually sort of evolved in this way. Uh, let me uh, we need to understand a little bit more actually how the internet actually is structured internally. So really the internet uh, is not one single network. Uh, instead, you know, if we look at this cloud, it actually is fragmented in all kinds of different networks. And each, you know, one of these networks, uh, you know, it corresponds roughly, you know, to an ICP, so an internet service provider. So one internet service provider, you know, manages one you know, part of the, the internet. Uh, and the internet ISPs collaborate together, you know, for using, you know, peering relationships to actually provide you uh, servers so that you can actually send you know, packets from one point in the internet and they actually arrive at the other end of the internet. Um, and this is an important uh, aspect of the design of the internet. So it's really is a network of network and it's actually an open network of network. Uh, so almost everybody can join uh, as uh, a service provider and there's no central administration or organization that actually manages the internet as a whole. Um, the ISPs just collaborate almost like in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion, that's why it's called peering relationships, uh, to provide this service. And so there's no so, a single person that sort of sets out the rules of the internet and can determine uh, what's going on. Um, so that's an important aspect to keep in mind. Um, in addition, uh, you know, as we've seen in the, the paper, there's a large number of protocols uh, that are actually of importance. Uh, and we're going to touch on some of them. You know, the one, of course, that we're going to be touching by, on is TCP, which is the trans tr transmission control protocol, which provides uh, connectivity, uh, a reliable byte stream from a client to server. Uh, and, and almost all the higher level protocols actually run on this. Uh, there are other protocols that we're going to be talking a little bit about, like IP, which is the base uh, protocol to uh, package, you know, take packets and write them from, you know, C2, from C2S. Um, uh, but there's also protocols for actually routing decisions, you know, BGP. Uh, there are protocols for logging in. Uh, you know, the paper talks about Telnet, which is basically replaced uh, these days with SSH. Uh, there's protocols like FTP, file transfer protocol, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a long, long list of protocols. Um, and some of these protocols are still in use. You know, for example, if I uh, look at my Linux box, you know, FTP, Telnet, uh, all those protocols actually are, are still there and you can use them. Um, some of the protocols are still in use. You know, for example, you know, we'll talk a little bit about DNS, the domain name system, you know, the way to resolve a domain name into an IP address. And that's a protocol that's still in existence and used, you know, widely. 
some other protocols, like for example, Telnet, you know, has gone out of sort of favor and we're being replaced by, you know, more secure variants. Um, so who decides on the protocols? Uh, you know, this is a question that came up a lot in the uh, questions that were asked. And so basically there's an organization called IETF and IETF uh, takes proposals for uh, protocols. Uh, they're called RFCs, Request for Comments. And uh, there's a group uh, that basically studies these RFCs, you know, uh, uh, and discusses them, and at some point, you know, they get standardized. And basically what it means to be standard is just a document uh, or a paper uh, that just describes actually what the protocol uh, does. And, uh, it has probably maybe some recommendations about how it should be implemented. And so the protocol itself doesn't uh, dictate an implementation. And in fact, for many protocols, there are different implementations. So for example, most OS uh, vendors will have their own implementation of TCP. And so uh, if there's a bug or a security exploit in one of the protocols, uh, there's sort of two possibilities. You know, there's a design flaw in the protocol itself which means that the standard has to be changed. Uh, and that is like a big, big, big deal. Uh, because that means like people have to you know, get together, decide that actually what the next version is it, you know, and the world has to switch from the, this old protocol to the new protocol. And that switching over tends to be a very difficult thing to do in, the, in an organization or in a network where there's no central authority. Uh, the other outcome is that there's a bug in the implement, you know, there's a way of fixing the implementation such that you know the protocol or the exploit is not possible anymore. And in that case, you know, basically we're sort of roughly in good shape. You know, a, uh, a bunch of OS vendors may actually have to update their implementation, but once the implementation is updated, uh, we're sort of up and running again. So that gives you a little bit of a sense uh, at the very high level, uh, you know, what we're dealing with here. So any questions so far? And again, feel, feel free to jump in or raise your hand. Um, okay, uh, so let me proceed. So let's say you'll talk a little bit about the internet today in terms of from the security perspective and basically sort of following off uh, on, uh, up on the paper. Because right? so the paper started out in 1989 or sort of late mid 80s uh, and uh, is a description of like the issues in uh, the mid 80s in terms of security and then uh, embedded in it is a sort of second paper for, uh, written 15 years later uh, that gives a perspective on uh, the security issues in the 80s um, and uh, you know provides some context and so you might wonder okay well what what is the current perspective and at a very high level uh, I think the perspective is as follows. The core of the internet is not really concerned uh, with security, but actually is mostly concerned with lightness. And uh, the many reasons for that, you know, partly this has to do with uh, the way the internet started out. When the internet started out, crypto was not really available. In fact, you know, a lot of the cryptographic primitives that we have now today didn't exist then. Uh, crypto was too expensive to actually do uh, frequently. Uh, or, in fact, there were also a loss, uh, a particular export loss, that made it impossible to actually export uh, crypto implementations to other countries. And so the, the core of the internet at the beginning didn't have a strong story for uh, security. Um, and in fact, you know, mostly was concerned even at that time with robustness. You know, the whole idea of packet switching was to actually build a very robust uh, network. And so it, it's still the case that the core of the network actually is uh, uh, focused on uh, lifeness. In fact, all the security is sort of delegated, you know, it's delegated to the end nodes. Um, and in many ways, that actually makes uh, a ton of sense uh, because in, often it's the end nodes that actually uh, really understand what, you know, security uh, means. So, for example, uh, asking a question in the context of uh, authenticating a web server in, in the context of the, the web protocol actually makes a sensible question. Uh, authenticating a particular IP address uh, for not particular any purpose is actually a much more difficult you know, question to answer. And uh, so and it makes a lot of sense to actually do security at the end nodes. Um, and so a lot of the protocols that really you know, deal with authentication and confidentiality are all in the end nodes. And in fact, you know, starting from next week, you know, we'll talk about one of these protocols that provides both confidentiality 
and authentication. And uh, many, you know, there's always a lot of discussion about this, uh, but in, in many ways, this is a good design. Uh, you know, one is concerns, you know, separates concerns where security is delegated to the end nodes and where the inner, the core of the network just has to focus on uh, liveness. Um, and one way, you know, maybe to make a very high level argument why the design is a reasonable good is that actually we're doing today uh, electronic commerce on the internet. You know, we're running cryptocurrency uh, applications on top of the internet. And these were applications when, you know, the internet was created where people were not even thinking about. I mean, those basically the, the internet was mostly used to actually share documents and uh, do email. And so, uh, the fact that it has evolved, you know, from sort of these more simple applications that have little security impact, that you know, applications that have tremendous security impact and can be supported on that same platform, uh, is a sort of made testimony to uh, that the design actually is a pretty effective design. Another aspect of that is that if you look at the technology changes between when the internet started and the technology that's used today, it's also dramatic. You know, there was no uh, wireless or Wi-Fi communication at all in the beginning of the internet, uh, but you know that has been sort of part and absorbed uh, in the existing internet. So the evolution of the internet has been uh, dramatic, and that partly is due to the sort of this open design um, and uh, a lot of flexibility in terms of the core of the network. And so most of the lecture uh, today is going to be really focused on the core of the network, and you know giving a little bit more. Uh, sense about like what kind of attacks uh, people have uh, or attackers have uh, deployed and uh, what the solutions we have been to actually fix them. Uh, so let me stop for a second here and just to give you uh, time to ask questions or jump in or if everything's clear so far that's fine too. Okay, uh, so let me proceed. And so let me uh, start off uh, where sort of the paper start off to give you a little bit of sense, you know, what the, you know, the world was in uh, sort of the early uh, 80s. And so let me start by uh, talking about Telnet. So Telnet is a protocol to log in from a client to a server and get a terminal uh, so that you can actually execute commands on the, on the server. And the, so the way, that actually tell that works and still works uh, is that in you know when it was designed there was no crypto uh, for the reasons that I mentioned earlier and so an attacker basically has a lot of possibilities right um, there's no crypto to authenticate you know the communication channel then you know the attacker can modify the data that's actually on the uh, telnet session uh, the attacker can inject new data. Uh, the attacker can, of course, just listen on the data. Uh, and, you know, the attacker can probably imp imp perform man in the middle attacks because there's like no way for the server, since there's no sort of cryptographic material involved, to actually uh, discover uh, that there was a man in the middle attack. And probably uh, uh, in, in one of the things uh, that actually was a real, you know, sort of concern when designing uh, Telnet or when people were deploying Telnet at a reasonable scale is you know, the worry that people would steal passwords. Uh, in particular, because, you know, passwords were uh, sent in the clear, uh, you know, there was always a concern that, you know, people be uh, an attacker that was listening on the network, you know, could actually steal uh, a password. And that turned out to be not a big issue in the early days of the internet, because, you know, the way the network was actually structured, uh, it was not that easy. First of all, there was no wireless, uh, so it's all fixed cables. And the way, you know, the arrangement of the cables was, it's actually reasonably difficult to actually listen into a particular com uh, conversation. That changed uh, dramatically when Ethernet uh, was used or uh, started to being deployed on a wide scale. And so, for example, the paper talks a little bit about it, that at at t Bell Labs, you know, when, uh, where Steve was at this particular point in time, uh, you know, he was in charge of like the first two, he owned like the first one and a half part or three Ethernet cables that were actually uh, Bell Labs was using. And the idea, the problem with the Ethernet was that, you know, basically it's a single cable with a lot of hosts on it. And in fact, you know, every packet basically on the cable is broadcast. 
And so every host on the network could see every traffic, uh, that, uh, so could see all traffic on that particular cable. And that meant, you know, for things like Telnet, that you know everybody uh, on that particular segment of the Ethernet could just see every packet coming by and, in fact, you know, steal people's password. And so as a response uh, to that, uh, the number of people in the uh, at Berkeley, you know, developed uh, a protocol called R logging uh, in. Uh, and the main goal of our login was to not send the password. So the idea was you know, to be able to log into a server uh, without actually sending the password at all. And that seems like a good, fantastic idea, right? Uh, it seems like a good security principle. And instead, you know, the, the idea was to uh, use a trusted host file. And um, the trusted host file basically in your home directory would include uh, or would list the IP addresses from which you, know, you could log into that particular server. And so then the idea was like, you know, I would log in from a particular IP address, you know, whatever, 1826.4.9 into some particular server. Yeah, the server would look in my home directory, see if 1826.4.9 uh, was in that file. If it was in that file, then basically, you know, basically give me a dollar prompt and I could start, you know, printing, uh, doing uh, commands. And so fundamentally, the security on this design relied on the fact that it was hard, or it was believed to be hard, hard to uh, fake a source address. Uh, and that was the basic assumption uh, uh, behind uh, uh, our login. And it turned out, you know, uh, even though, you know, people clearly had uh, thoughts about security, you know, for example, not sending the password, that turned out to be not true. Uh, although that was absolutely not obvious at that particular point in time that it wasn't true. Um, you know, the, we very often, you know, the, 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 the security correct, the, you know, the overall design might be good, but there might be some detail that actually is wrong or some assumption that was made that was not completely right. And that is exactly the case uh, with uh, this particular assumption that is hard to fake uh, source, source addresses. Um, and this is an important point uh, because for a long time people believed, until actually not that long ago, that you, know, you could use the source IP address, you know, the IP address that sits in the, the, the source address that sits in the IP packet, and if you receive that packet from the network, uh, you look at that IP packet and you look at the source fields. Uh, many people, uh, many designers, and many uh, practitioners believe that basically, well, that that you know that is the legit you know, source address or the authentic source address. And it took people a long time to actually get to the point that basically you can't use the source address as an authentication uh, token. So let me explain a little bit, you know, how the attack worked that really demonstrated that this is actually uh, you can't do that. And so to do that, we have to look at one of the protocols uh, that's used uh, and on top of which our login and telnet run, uh, which is TCP, you know, the reliable transfer uh, control protocol. Uh, and so the setting, so and the particular part you know, that's important is the initial handshake in TCP. So uh, there's a, let me draw some timelines. So there's a client, there's a server, and uh, the way the handshake works is as follows. Um, the client actually sends a packet, oops. The client sends a packet you know, to the server uh, uh, saying, well, with the source being set to C, uh, so the server can actually respond, the destination set to you know, S in the IP packet, and uh, the SYN field of the packet is sent to an initial or a sequence number picked by the client. So sequence number uh, picked by the client. And the reason uh, this handshake actually is in place is to, for the server and the client to synchronize on sequence numbers. Uh, because the protocol is a reliable uh, transfer protocol, it uses sequence numbers to de de detect duplicates uh, so that if a packet is resent and you know the same packet research up, shows up twice at the server, uh, it will have the same sequence number, and the server can basically throw away the second copy. So that's why the sequence numbers are there. And so the basic idea is then that the server responds, you know, to uh, the client in the normal case uh, with its own uh, sequence number, you know, SNS, and uh, with an acknowledgement for you know, sequence number S and C, you know, indicating that uh, it has received you know, sequence number S and C, and that's that, the first packet, the SYN packet, and 
uh, that the uh, and that its first sequence number that the uh, client should expect from the server is SNS. And then basically the client can start sending data, you know, to the server, uh, acting, you know, SNS, uh, indicating that it actually received the acknowledgement on its original SYN packet, and then you know some data. Um, attacked with the sequence number, you know, SNC plus one, uh, indicating that the next sequence number to be used is that. So that's the normal uh, sort of handshake protocol or the handshake step in the TCP protocol. Let me stop for a second there and ask if there's any questions uh, so far. Yeah, um, Franz, I think yeah. student just asked, um, Student just requested if you could just write um, everything smaller so that they can see more text. Okay, um, I'll try. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so so now let's switch to the attack. Um, and by the way, I will uh, publish all the boards. Uh, so these are basically my uh, the boards, and I will uh, take the document with the boards and uh, publish them later uh, with the lecture. So you can go back in case you. Uh, uh, my handwriting was unclear or too small or too big. Um, so let's uh, talk about the attack. So the attack. Can I, can I ask a question? Yeah, please. Um, I'm, I'm wondering about why, why can't the client and the server have the same uh, SYN or the SNC? Ah, the, 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 this is a uh, bi-directional communication protocol. And so the client, you know, sends bytes to the server uh, with the sequence numbers that it chooses, and the server responds with uh, it can send uh, a stream of bytes, you know, to the client over the same connections, and those bytes are tagged with the sequence number of the server. So it's for for multiple. So the server can communicate with more clients than. Clients no, no. This this is per uh, per source uh, per source destination uh, pair. Uh, it is so that basically the source, the client and the server can talk in parallel over the same channel. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, so what is the attack? Uh, you know, and like with all attacks, you know, in hindsight, trivial. Uh, so we, again, we have our two timelines, you know, here's the server, here's the uh, attacker in this case, and the attacker sends a packet, uh, the first packet to the uh, server as follows, and in fact, but it puts instead of you know puts its own IP address, it actually puts the IP address of the client that it wants to impersonate. And this was actually in the days of Ethernet reasonable simple, uh, because you know if you have an operating system or a host that sits on the Ethernet cable, uh, you can modify you know the operating system slightly, and so that you can actually write you know the uh, any IP address into uh, the packet, and then send it off to the server. And so the destination, of course, is still equal to the server. And you know you pick some, uh, and the client, the attacker picks you know a standard you know sequence number for itself. Uh, so nothing really uh, special on it. So the only thing that has changed is basically the source field has changed. Now the server response, because it just sees as a, a normal SYN thing, so it will send a response. And the response, uh, I'm not going to include. Uh, it will include the sequence number chosen by the server. And it's going to be sent, of course, to the destination is set to client uh, because the server sees a packet coming from the client and it will send it back to the uh, client. And so this packet goes somewhere, uh, and we'll talk about it in a second. Uh, but the basic idea now for the attacker is if the attacker could guess what the sequence number uh, is that the server actually has picked, what it could do, it could just like, you know, let's ignore the packet uh, where the packet is on. It could actually construct another packet. And that packet will you know, include, of course, the sequence number of itself. And so, um, so it's going to be the source. It's going to be the attacker is going to set it to A or to C again. Uh, it's going to uh, uh, and set the uh, sequence number, you know, the ACK to the sequence number of SNS. And you know whatever the the uh, the next sequence number uh, for uh, the data packet uh, is going to be equal to whatever SN SNC plus one, correct? Right? And so 
so there's two things going on. And there's one, there's that second packet uh, is flying across the network. Uh, we need to do something about it. So this is that packet. We need to talk a little bit about what that, that does. And then uh, there's a, uh, this other packet that the attacker constructed has guessed you know, the sequence number SN. And so if the attacker was able to guess that sequence number correctly, uh, then the server will accept whatever set of bytes that packet contains and will process them. And so in the case of our login, uh, that probably would be a shell command. And so basically the first you know, set of bytes would constitute some shell command uh, that would be run by the server because you know, the sequence number uh, is exactly what the server is expecting. And so there's two interesting questions here. You know, how, what happens to that second packet and how to guess the sequence number? So the, basically the goal of the attacker is to basically suppress that the second packet arrives at the uh, client C because then the client C might actually reset the connection and send a packet to the server saying like, oh, uh, that's not the connection, that connection is long in the past or it's not my connection, current connection. Uh, it's not the connection I'm trying to set up. And so you can set in the TCP protocol a reset packet. And that would, uh, if that reset packet arrived before the third packet you know, sent by the attacker, then you know, the attacker would fail. And so it's, the attacker has to have some way of suppressing that second packet, or at least making sure that it doesn't arrive at the server, at the client. And there's a couple of ways of doing that. Uh, one would be to wait to send that packet until basically the server, until the client actually is down. Maybe the client is down for maintenance. And so it actually won't respond to any packets. And so then at that point, you can impersonate you know, that uh, source address. Uh, or you know, there's another way of basically flooding you know, the client uh, with a number of uh, TCP connection to where the client, so that the client actually doesn't receive uh, that second packet. So there's sort of a number of ways of you know, exploiting that or arranging that. And so, th so now the focus is really on that second question, you know, how can the attacker guess you know, that sequence number? So that turns out uh, you know, to be reasonable straightforward. Uh, at least in the implementations at that, at that particular time. So guess the sequence number SNS. So we need to know a little bit about how sequence numbers are picked. Uh, and so there's the server basically has a global sequence number, initial sequence number, ISN. And that ISN uh, is a sequence number that is a number that slowly changes over time. And in fact, you know, the way it actually works is that the server adds you know, 128 to it, uh, per second, and uh, it, uh, uh, if there's no traffic, if no connections were made to the uh, server for a period of time, it just adds 128 uh, to it, and otherwise it will add 64, you know, per new connection. And the reason, you know, that it increases slowly over time is to actually for duplicate detection, right? We don't want to increase it by a large number. Uh, or you know, set it back or keep the same number because maybe a packet from an old, uh, uh, an old uh, TCP connection is going to come in and we want to be able to throw these old packets away. And so then the sequence number you know, increases slowly over time to basically maintain the ordering. Um, so now it's pretty, you know, hopefully it's pretty obvious you know, how an attacker can actually guess the, the sequence number. Uh, so for example, what the attacker could do is just make a regular Attack, uh, connection. So the attacker can just make from his own address A, uh, say, you know, to the server a TCP connection, and we'll get a sequence number back for the server, and I, an SNC, that is uh, some number. And basically, the only thing it has to do, uh, if it then wants to impersonate, you know, the, uh, the client C, is just basically add 64 to the sequence number. It can guess that the next you know, sequence number is going to be the sequence number it received plus you know, 64. And then, you know, basically is in business. Does this make sense? I'm going to stop here for a second. Oh, would you mind repeating that last bit? Yeah. Uh, so, okay, so the last bit is, you know, we need to guess, so we now, there's two pieces of information here. The server picks sequence numbers in a particular way, namely, it adds 128 per uh, second if there's no connections, but if there's a connection, uh, it will add 64. So if the 
attacker wants to guess the sequence number for the next connection so that it can use it in its attack, then the attacker can make a regular TCP connection uh, with no falsifying, nothing, just a regular TCP connection. It will receive back a sequence number that's chosen by the server. It will know that the next, if no other you know, uh, client makes a connection, if it, make, uh, it makes a connection immediately right after that, that the next sequence number that the server will choose is going to be SN net. It's going to be that plus 64, assuming it was the last you know, connection it made. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. OK, so basically, you know, uh, so the attacker sort of achieved its goal, correct? You know, we, uh, based on this information, uh, the attacker uh, you know, can guess you know, that, that second sequence number in that third packet, and, and that way, uh, send some data to the server. And that was basically uh, the exploit you know, that was used you know, to uh, you know, log into uh, remote machines uh, without actually having to type a password uh, and by faking basically the IP address uh, of a client and then be able to log in as somebody else who had that particular address in their host file. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about like, what you know, attacks this, this enables. So, from a sequence number of guessing, you know, what attacks are possible. Well, uh, one, you can forge the source address, which is like what we just talked about. But a couple other things that you could do. Uh, the second thing that is possible is you can actually launch uh, a denial service attack or a DOS attack as they are called. Uh, and, you know, basically if, um, somebody can actually uh, guess you know the uh, client sequence number uh, then uh, the attacker can construct uh, and reset packet and send that to the server with the client sequence number the server will accept it because it's a sequence number that the server actually expects and then actually will close the tcp connection that's in principle not a big problem uh, you know the connection will be closed and maybe the application will open it again but actually in the context of bgp the border gateway protocol, which actually runs over TCP connections, this actually turns out to be a reasonable big issue because <clears throat> a failure of a TCP connection indicates uh, to the routing protocol or is a signal to the routing protocol that basically that link is not working. And as a result, uh, BGP will reconfigure and change its address tables, routing tables, so that that link actually is not then used anymore. And in fact, uh, for a couple minutes, or th that link will, just won't be used. And you know, this has been used in the past to you know, basically create uh, an internet that is sort of you know, coming up and down uh, with different links and uh, allow you know, basically uh, corner off people of the internet so that they can't communicate. A third possible attack uh, that can be used based on, based on guessing sequence numbers is you can actually hijack, you know, if the attacker is in the right position, uh, in a network, the attacker is uh, uh, possibly capable of hijacking uh, an existing TCP connection uh, by guessing both the client sequence number as well as the server sequence number. Um, in fact, this kind of attack was actually uh, you know, still particularly irrelevant. Uh, for example, there was a paper in 2016 you know, that showed uh, that you know, if you listened to the, the, the basically used uh, correlation techniques to actually figure out what the client and server sequence numbers was, and then imposed uh, itself you know, between the client and the server and was basically uh, able to perform a man uh, attack. Okay, so that's the sequence number attack. And the reason I'm gonna go, uh, go, go in quite a bit of detail is to just give you the flavor of what kind of attacks uh, you can, what attackers can pull off at the level of the, the core of the internet. Um, and so now let's talk a little bit about like the mitigations. Um, so, at the top level, uh, the, and this is the main uh, message from this paper, is that you just cannot uh, use IP addresses as an authentication token. Uh, and so if you want to do uh, serious authentication, you have to use end-to-end -end, uh, end -end crypto-based crypto -based, uh, authentication. 
And so think about you know, protocols such as you know, SSL, which we'll talk about uh, next week, or you know, protocols like SSH uh, that actually support uh, you know, strong authentication based on cryptographic primitives. And in, in many ways, you know, that is the right solution uh, and uh, the preferable solution. Now, of course, you, know, you want to make it harder for people to actually pull off you know, these sequence numbers attacks you know, just to make the core of the internet a little bit more robust. Uh, and so there's uh, other things you could do is like ISPs can filter packets. And in fact, you know, almost all ISPs you know, do that today. Uh, and so for example, if a simple rule for filtering packet uh, is that let's say uh, a packet comes in from another ISP uh, but the source address, you know, uh, contains an address that actually belongs to the receiving IP. Uh, the receiving IP knows that, that this cannot be a correct packet because, you know, if it was a correct packet, it should have been coming from it and not coming to it. Uh, and in fact, you know, ISP have much more complicated filter rules, but it gives you sort of a sense uh, what can be done. This turns out to be reasonable hard because of uh, multi-homing. Uh, so both multi-homing. So clients might be connected through multiple ISPs to the network, you know, for, to the internet for robustness. And so the packets might actually not come always from a single ISP, they might come up for a different ISP. And so the filtering rules are actually have to be reasonable complex. A third thing that almost any institution does, and is actually, and you know, you're, most of you are very familiar with, is that, uh, firewalls uh, between the internet and the institutions. And, and again, those firewalls you know, implement all kinds of uh, filtering rules you know, to make it harder to pull off you know, the, the, these attacks that actually uh, spoof uh, IP addresses. But none of these uh, last two uh, mechanisms are actually uh, bulletproof, um, but they just make it harder. You know, the only technique that is really bulletproof is the first one. But as we know, like the whole goal, you know, I think this is like part of these attacks, you know, what they taught, you know, the internet community is that uh, the real goal of the core of the internet should not be, you know, providing authentication uh, or confidentiality, but basically uh, lightness. And so uh, in, in that context, you know, the other thing uh, that you could try to do is basically harden TCP to make the protocol much harder uh, to pull off uh, or this particular attack uh, to pull off. Uh, and in fact, this is uh, uh, all TCP implementations today actually have uh, mechanisms in place, you know, to indeed make that uh, attack harder to pull off. So we can talk a little bit about how you, you could do that. So one possibility uh, you might think about, and this is not going to work, uh, is, you know, we're going to pick, the server picks a random sequence number. Uh, and I put a question mark there because you know this, it actually is not going to work. It's just a thought experiment. Um, and the reason that actually is not a good idea is that um, uh, the whole reason that the sequence numbers are there is actually for duplicate detection. And so you want the sequence numbers to uh, the server sequence number to uh, grow slowly over time, uh, so that actually you can do reliable. Uh, duplicate detection. If you jump you know, like far, far ahead in the future, it might wrap around in the sequence number space. And therefore, then the server might see uh, a packet coming in from a previous and old uh, TCP connection and accept it as a new, you know, fresh uh, IP packet, even though it isn't. And so you can't just jump around in the sequence number space. Um, another option you might think of is, well, we'll do random increments of the sequence number instead of picking a complete random uh, sequence number. But even that is not, you know, has to particularly, has the same problem uh, that you, uh, you know, may, may result in a wraparound uh, problem or basically not duplicate detection, not really working correctly. So, um, so the, the, there's one actually, you know, sort of saving observation uh, that can help us here is that the sequence number really has to be unique or it has to uh, be ordered you know, for a pair of source destination. I mean, the sequence numbers of different pairs of source and destination can be completely arbitrary uh, because, you know, the duplicate detection is only done between a particular source and a particular destination. And so uh, what you could do, 
is actually have a random increment for a particular source and destination. Uh, and of course, you have to be a little bit careful how to do that because you're going to want to make it hard for the attacker to guess, you know, what that increment is. And so the uh, the way that actually you know a TCP implementation would implement it today is the sequence number SN is computed as follows. You take the old way of computing the initial sequence number, so like plus 64 or plus 128, and then plus uh, the number that you add is actually a cryptographic hash. Uh, I'm just going to write down the SHA-1, although you know, people in practice don't use the SHA-1, uh, of you know, the source and destination. This is the source destination and you know, some secret. And the secret is chosen by uh, the server. And because this is a cryptographic hash function, uh, the output of the cryptographic hash function, it's hard to invert. So once you have the output of the SHA-1, which of course the client will have, or maybe the attacker has, because it's a cryptographic hash function based on the output, you can actually not figure out what, you know, it's computationally intractable to compute the inputs. And so uh, it should be impossible for an attacker that gets a copy of these set of, you know, encrypted or the, sh the SHA-1 uh, bits to actually uh, figure out what that particular secret is. And so uh, by doing this, uh, you know, the, this is a simple trick. Uh, this, uh, the, the, the sequence number actually is very difficult uh, for the attacker to guess, uh, and uh, it's actually easy for the server uh, to compute. In fact, there's no extra state that the server has to maintain other than you know, a single integer, you know, basically, or a single number uh, that corresponds to the secret, and you know, it's typically picked up at boot time, or it may sometimes change over, uh, uh, sometimes changed. Okay, does this make sense? Let me stop here again for a second and find out if there's any questions. Uh, I have a, another question. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, I, I was wondering how the attacker knows the sequence number of the client in the TCP sequence number attack earlier. Yeah, in the... Uh, The, the, you mean, and let me uh, ask you the question in the, uh, in the first, uh, okay, so it depends on the, uh, okay, let me, uh, um, the attacker, correct, sends in the first packet, uh, the sequence number here, the sequence number, it's actually chosen by the attacker. Right, so the server will use that sequence number as the sequence number that the, uh, the client has chosen. Oh, okay. So, so the SNC there, could, could that also be written as SN sub A? Yes, that could totally be, uh, that would be a perfectly fine way of thinking about it. Okay, thank you. And the, the 64 and 128 is just a yeah. convention of... Yeah, so that's why, yeah, that's how TCP was implemented at that time. And in fact, it was more or less still what happens. And the reason for doing that is because of duplicate detection between uh, TCP connections. So that's an implementation detail, uh, but an important implementation detail and it's there for correctness. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay. Uh, there's a few questions in chat. Yeah, those are, hold on, let me see. Uh, if they're not answered, you know, feel free to ask them. Okay. Now, in that case, I'm going to proceed. Uh, so, you know, why this long spiel on sequence numbers? Well, a couple of reasons. Uh, one, to give the flavor of the kind of attacks uh, that people pull off at this level of the network. Uh, second of all, uh, to really harp this point that basically source addresses cannot be used as an authentication token. Uh, 
uh, and still is actually a common practice. Uh, actually, until very, very recently, you know, a couple of years ago, the MIT libraries were using uh, the source uh, of an IP packet. For example, if any packet came from an address, you know, in MIT's domain, namely 18 dot dot dot, then uh, they would accept uh, that packet and, for example, uh, uh, hand out, you know, uh, publications that were sitting behind a, a paywall. Um, and the reason, of course, that people would do this is just a very convenient way of uh, doing authentication, uh, and even though it actually is not uh, bulletproof. And, and the right way requires more mechanisms, as we'll uh, talk about uh, next week. Um, and so uh, it also let people to really realize that you know, the, the job of the core of the network is not really you know, strong security, uh, but it's really about lifeness. Um, So the real goal, uh, you know, the main feature that actually the core of the internet has to provide is liveness. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about liveness, you know, for the, the rest of the lecture. Um, and so first, you know, give uh, uh, just sort of an idea about like what is meant uh, with liveness and what is the risk. Uh, let me talk about an attack, uh, in particular, uh, a denial serve attack. Um, that actually got popular in the in 1996. Uh, in fact, you know that was sort of the starting point of lots of uh, uh, liveness attacks or DOS attacks. And the particular attack uh, uh, that I'm going to describe is a very simple one, uh, and it's based on sin flooding. Uh, and the reason, uh, one reason to pick this attack is one of the first one actually that was very effective. And second reason to pick this attack, <coughs> it is part of the, it again exploits the uh, uh, weakness in the uh, implementation of TCP. Um, and so uh, this scenario is as follows. We have an attacker, we have a server. Uh, the attacker, you know, opens the, the TCP connection by sending a SYN packet and, and, a, and then a, a TCP sequence number chosen by the, the attacker or the client in this case. Uh, the server will respond uh, and you know, we'll send a packet back to the attacker. So we're not changing the source address, you know, the same address is, uh, it's a legit uh, IP address. So the, attacker, the packet will come back you know, to the attacker and the attacker basically ignores it. Uh, it doesn't really do anything. So it doesn't, you know, uh, basically uh, causes the server to have a half connection open. Uh, and the, instead, what the attacker does, it sends actually yet another SYN packet for a new connection. And in fact, it does a couple more times. In fact, you know, turns out that, you know, if you did this a 50 to 100 times, depending on exactly the operating system, you would run the server's operating system out of you know, TCP control blocks. And the TCP control blocks is the data structure that the operating system maintains to keep track of the state of the TCP connection. For example, keep track of this, uh, the sequence number of the client. Um, and in uh, that time, in the early TCP implementations, uh, the, the number of control blocks was a fixed number. And so if the attacker uh, sent enough SYN requests that opened a number of connections but didn't really finish them or didn't close them, then uh, the server would run out of TCP blocks. And the next, you know, TCP connection from any you know uh, client that you know any legit client uh, would actually fail. Mom, I'm in a meeting. Be quiet. <laughs> oh, uh, okay. So, um, uh, and 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 um, and this turned out to be you know the way the attackers used this is the uh, since websites in the nine uh, in the nineties became popular. Uh, they would try to uh, extort money out of website by saying like, you know, if you don't give me money, then I will sin flood you website and your sin website will be off offline. Uh, and so uh, this was a reasonable uh, big deal. Uh, and so some mechanism had to be ensured basically that uh, the lifeness of the network uh, didn't uh, fall apart. Uh, and of course, you know, you can make the, the number dynamic. Uh, but that just postpones when you know the server will run out of uh, TCP connections or uh, TCP control blocks. At some point, you know it has a limited amount of physical memory, and it will just run out. And so the solution to this problem, uh, or the solution that people came up with in this problem, is something that's called SYN cookies. Uh, 
And this is of a similar flavor as you know, the sequence number solution. Um, it uses a clever way of encoding uh, state in the sequence number that is actually sent to the client so that the server doesn't actually have to remember the client sequence number. And, and so we're, we're gonna, uh, and so it doesn't have to maintain any state. And so the basic idea is as follows. The way you pick the sequence number that the server chooses is as follows. You uh, pick the sequence number that you received from the client and you add to that a number and that number corresponds to a timestamp, TS, uh, concatenated with the SHA-1 of you know, the source, destination, uh, the secret, you know, just for the, as before, and the timestamp. So uh, this constructs you know, basically uh, a surface sequence number in a particular fashion. And the, way, the reason that this sequence number is a good way, uh, uh, a good construction, is that when the client, when the client sends a next packet, if a legit client, so not the attacker, but a legit client sends it, uh, an, uh, opens up the does the second step of the opening up of the TCP connection, uh, it will send something of the form SN, you know, C plus one, you know, acknowledge, uh, uh, acknowledging the surface sequence number, so in SNS, and, you know, its next uh, sequence number that the client will pick. And so what the server can do is it can basically subtract one, you know, from the sequence number that it receives from the client on the next packet. So that will give us SN, uh, uh, S and C, and now the server, the client, and the server can recompute basically what the SNS you know is just based on the information uh, th that it has. It has you know the secret, and it has a timestamp, and the timestamp is a number that actually slowly increases over time, maybe every couple minutes. So it just has to maintain, remember one timestamp you know for all uh, outstanding TCP connections. It has to remember the secret, but it doesn't have to remember any per TCP connection state. And so it can just recompute, you know, the secret timestamp, the destination, the source, and, and timestamp, recompute the number SNS, uh, and it actually should come out, you know, to the SNS that it receives from the uh, client. And if they're the same, uh, the server knows that, you know, this is actually the second step of a TCP connection that's being opened for which it has seen the first packet, uh, but it hasn't recorded any state for that first packet. So this is basically a clever trick to uh, ensure that you don't actually have to maintain any uh, sequence, no, you don't have to maintain any TCP control blocks you know, at, at the first packet, uh, and that you only have maintain state of a TCP control block once the complete you know, connection is, is enabled or set up. And that basically stops you know, this uh, simple SIN flooding attack. Uh, there are, of course, more compl complicated SIN flooding attacks are possible, but now they're going to be harder to start pulling off. And you can, like, now you have to send a lot more uh, connections, or you have to use different IP addresses, and those are going to be easier to detect than this particular very uh, slow, uh, low-cost, you know, TCP or uh, attack. I'm going to stop here again and just see if there's any questions. Yeah, I see a raised hand from Max NZ. Maybe that's oh, sorry, uh, sorry. I should I should have unraised that. Okay. <laughs> Any questions so far? Okay. So basically, what the game is, you know, with uh, these flooding or uh, protecting against flooding attacks, is to make sure that the, the server doesn't have to do much work on a per client request. And basically, sort of changes the balance, you know, to the client, so that the client has a ton of work to do. And if the client has a ton of work to do, for example, send a lot of packets to launch the attack, then the uh, it's much more uh, uh, clear that the client's actually launch, launching the attack, and it's actually easier uh, for uh, servers to uh, protect against them. And you know, one trick that we saw in a second here was the sync cookie. Uh, but similar tricks like this are used to actually protect against other, you know, kind of uh, D, uh, DOS attacks. So let me talk about one more uh, to give you a little bit of sense, you know, uh, what what attacks are uh, possible. And so here is the 
uh, attack, which is based on uh, amplification. So I said before, you know, the, uh, the, the game that we want to try to do, of course, uh, is to make sure that, is, that there's a lot of work for the client, to for the attacker to launch an attack. Uh, and of course, you know, the attacker's plan is to sort of try to have other entities in the network try to do the amplification or do a lot of the work uh, by exploiting some weaknesses in either implementations or bugs. And so one uh, popular one for a while was something is called uh, DNS amplification. Um, and so the, the scenario should follow us. We have an attacker. Uh, we have a DNS server. And uh, we have a client or a server sitting here. And let's say the attacker wants to sin flood you know, the, uh, this particular server. You know, what it does is going to send a DNS request to the server. And the DNS requests actually are sent over a protocol called UDP, not TCP. And, uh, and, uh, and it doesn't have basically any uh, mechanism to uh, uh, authenticate source addresses at all. And it doesn't have any you know, techniques like you know, the sequence number uh, um, trick that we saw before uh, to protect you know, against uh, faking IP addresses. So what the attacker does, it actually sends in the source address uh, the IP address of the server that it wants to attack. And then basically the game uh, that the attacker wants to play is that it wants to look up an address uh, for a particular server uh, where the response is actually very big. And so, and this turns out the case, like if you're using, if the server actually signs, you know, its records uh, so that, you know, people can authenticate it, uh, then it turns out that the DNS response actually tends to be quite large. So the DNS request itself is very small the packet that goes from A to the DNS server, but the packet that actually goes then from the DNS server to the server, uh, because the DNS uh, server will respond you know, to the, uh, the address that's in the source field, so it will send it on to actually the server. And it, if this request is big, then it will basically flood you know, the connection you know, to the server and, then there, and thereby make it impossible for other uh, clients to connect to the server. Um, and basically, you know, some clever attackers, you know, figured this out uh, that, you know, for, you know, particular types of DNS records, uh, they are incredibly big. And so you get this sort of free application from the attacker. So the attacker has to invest very little resources and gets, uh, and then consumes a lot of resources uh, between the two, uh, on the, the connection to the server. And basically flooding uh, the server with, you know, basically bad traffic so that other people can't get through. And again, you know, this was used you know, for sort of extortion attacks where, uh, you know, the attacker would call up the server operator and say, basically, you know, I'm going to take your website down unless, you know, you uh, stop or unless you pay me and then I won't uh, put a, I won't launch a DOS attack. Um, you know, the way this, this gets fixed, and we're going to talk, talk about it in great amount of detail, uh, is that DNS servers you know, do something what's called damping at this, uh, at, at this time. So a good implemented DNS server uh, will uh, reduce the, uh, if they're seeing a lot of uh, requests for a particular, from a particular IP address, uh, it will actually reduce the, uh, it will uh, stop responding at some point uh, and thereby uh, uh, making it impossible for the attacker to actually launch or make it very difficult for the attacker to launch this kind of attack. So if you're interested in, you know, look up DNS uh, uh, temp, uh, 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 yeah, if you look up the DNS uh, you, 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 uh, amplification, uh, you'll uh, see uh, descriptions about how to uh, do the dampening in a way that, you know, this attack is much more difficult to uh, pull off. Uh, recently, uh, you know, just to give you a sense, this attack is actually from a while back, but like, you know, two years ago or three years ago, uh, the same kind of attack was actually pulled off by, uh, by attackers where they noticed that, you know, there are uh, some memcached services that's sitting on the public internet uh, and memcached also uses UDP and they basically send, you know, small requests to the, uh, with fake source addresses to the memcached server and picking up keys that result in huge responses. And those huge responses then would be sent again, you know, to a server S. Uh, uh, and in fact, uh, uh, 
there's some notes or pointers in the lecture notes that actually uh, you can read about if you're, you're, you're curious about it. Uh, but so this whole game of sort of uh, amplification is sort of a standard uh, problem uh, that protocols have to defend against uh, if they want to be resistant uh, to denial service attacks. Okay, let me stop there for a second again and give people an opportunity to ask questions before I switch over to the last uh, set of protocols that I want to talk about. All of these protocols tend to be focused on one IP address, but if like a attacker had a whole server room or like a botnet or something, it doesn't really defend against that, right? That's correct. Uh, so the, the, uh, the, if an attacker wants to launch, you know, these kinds of denial service attacks are still possible, uh, uh, but basically it requires you know, some form of a botnet. Uh, at this point, you know, things are getting a lot more expensive you know, for the attacker. And so uh, it shifts the, uh, basically the cost uh, around, uh, but it doesn't make it impossible. And these are kind of attacks you, know, you still see today but in much more lower frequency than before. Does that make sense? Okay, good. Um, so let me continue uh, and, uh, and, and sort of hit the last uh, set of protocols uh, that I wanna talk about, which are routing protocols which are clearly very related you know, to lifeness uh, of the internet. Uh, and so there's a couple, and, and these tend to be, uh, the, uh, let me walk through a couple, a number of them I mentioned in the paper, or, but I will talk about the newer versions of those protocols. So one protocol is DHCP, uh, which has sort of replaced ARP, which was discussed in the paper quite a bit. And so DHCP is like the protocol, uh, you are probably all familiar with it. You know, when you connect your laptop to say a Wi-Fi network, you know, your uh, uh, laptop is gonna send out the DHCP request and the DHCP server will respond back saying like, here's your IP address and here's your DNS and here's your router, the address of your router and here's your DNS resolver. Um, and uh, clearly, you know, this, 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 the, the DHCP server is uh, sort of a, a root of trust here. And uh, so the risk is that, uh, let's say you're on a wireless network, uh, somebody on that wireless network, the attacker in the wireless network runs its own DHCP server and you know, perhaps responds quicker or uh, than the standard DHCP server and can then basically uh, fake uh, the client or your, your laptop into uh, you know, providing the misleading information like an incorrect DNS name, you know, and as a result, uh, your laptop thinks, you know, so they're talking to a particular uh, site, but it actually isn't. Um, now, of course, the attack is a little bit harder to pull off, you know, because you have to have to be on, uh, on that same wireless network that the uh, client is connecting to. Uh, but then, for example, whatever, you know, Starbucks, you know, cafe, you know, maybe you're, you can be able to pull those kind of attacks off. Um, and, and really, again, what the, uh, and this is a little bit hard to uh, do actually something about on the network level itself, uh, but there's a number of things that people do. Like, for example, in uh, MIT, you know, we separate, you know, the wireless network in a uh, secure and insecure network. And basically the secure network actually is, uh, uh, requires that you register your machine uh, beforehand and um, you know, so that makes it more difficult uh, so that the server actually knows, you know, the uh, uh, MAC addresses of the, the, the medium access card network addresses, you know, off laptops that are actually legit laptops that can be sitting on the network. Um, there's also a whole kinds of set of mechanisms in routers to basically try to discover uh, whether there's a fake DHCP or a rogue DHCP server sitting on your network so that, you know, they can uh, take it down. Uh, and so even though we're using DHCP still today and it actually is pretty good, uh, but, you know, you, one has to pay attention to this particular sort of critical detail. Uh, another protocol uh, which uh, the paper talks about quite a bit about uh, is a protocol called RIP, R-I-P, 
routing internet protocol, uh, which has actually been replaced uh, by a protocol called BGP, the Border Gateway Protocol. Um, and that basically, uh, I mentioned it earlier in the lecture, that basically arranges as a protocol for actually setting up routing tables uh, between uh, ISPs. And so one ISP might advertise uh, a route to say MIT, and uh, then the receiving ISP uses that route advertisement to route packets along the path that actually is advertised to actually uh, get to, uh, to arrange that clients, you know, its customers actually can reach MIT. And the central challenge here uh, is that uh, if an attacker uh, can cook up uh, its own route advertisement, it could mislead uh, an ISP and interpose basically itself between uh, the ISP and the destination. So for example, if uh, some attacker would be uh, advertising that uh, to reach you know, uh, MIT, you have to go through ISP A, and if the attacker controls ISP A, then basically all the, traffic, all the traffic between the client and MIT would go through ISP A, and ISP A can then you know, play all kinds of games uh, uh, that, that might not be uh, beneficial to the uh, uh, to the uh, or could, you know, it, it might it might lead into uh, problems for the clients that are actually routing now through uh, this ISPA. Um, and these are tank attacks actually you know sort of in, they happened early on uh, and had big impact uh, because it was very easy to falsify basically at route advertisements and would take, for example, whole countries of the network. And in fact, this often happened uh, almost by accident where some ISP would, you know, by accident configure their routing information incorrectly and uh, cost, you know, as a result, some other, you know, ISPs or countries to actually go off the internet. Uh, of course, the you know, attackers noticed this and said like, oh, we can exploit this you know, for, our own, uh, for our own bad purposes. Um, and this turns out to be a problem that's actually very hard to fix. Uh, you know, clearly is related to lifeness uh, of the internet, um, and, uh, but it's hard to fix. And the reason it's hard to fix is because the internet is an open network. Um, and there's no central authority. And so particularly, uh, there are protocols that have been proposed, like secure BGP, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that uh, attempt to solve this by using cryptographic keys. Uh, and so basically every route advertisement is, is, is signed uh, and authenticated, uh, but you know, the hard problem actually in an open network actually is to do key management. If there's no uh, central point of trust that can actually testify that a particular public key is indeed the public key of a particular ISP, <coughs> then, uh, then it's actually very hard to get any confidence uh, in, um, uh, in a particular uh, public key. And so uh, these protocols that have been proposed in the past, you know, for signing uh, route advertisement actually haven't really gotten quick adoption. Um, nevertheless, you know, there's uh, lots of uh, different uh, uh, things that people have been trying to do. Uh, and, and some of them actually have gotten a little bit of uh, attraction. Uh, so for example, uh, there's a, uh, an, an, an effort called, you know, Manners, uh, and which uh, tries to address this problem by basically keeping a database of, uh, or trying to keep uh, have a whole bunch of ISPs, you know, collaborate together to keep a database of uh, basically public keys, you know, for ISPs, so that actually the route advertisements uh, of ISPs can actually be verified uh, with the keys against that particular database. Of course, you know, maintaining that database is a tricky issue. Uh, but actually this approach has gotten quite a bit of traction. Uh, so there's quite a number of ISPs actually collaborating uh, to do this. And not every ISP uh, collaborates, but you know, a large chunk uh, of ISPs do. And in fact, basically the major cloud, the major ISPs that provide cloud service like Amazon, Google, uh, you know, Microsoft, you know, collaborate with the major ISPs that provide customer service like you know, AT&T, Comcast, and basically have direct peering relationship with each other uh, and so therefore it's very hard for an attacker to actually, you know, get in between, uh, uh, be between them. And that has, uh, has been reasonable successful, but nevertheless, you know, when, every day there, uh, or once in a while, uh, there are you know, these sort of BGP attacks that maybe have limited 
uh, impact as opposed to, to uh, be disastrous, uh, but they're still being uh, pulled off. Okay, so that gets me close to the end of the lecture. So maybe before uh, stopping, let me, and so before summarizing, let me ask if there's any questions about this, uh, about routing protocols. I see no hands being raised. I hear nobody talking, so uh, let me then sort of summarize. Uh, so the internet is an open network. We're an open network of networks. Uh, and that makes it actually very challenging to do uh, you know, strong security inside of the uh, inside of the network, and mostly because you know, key management in a decentralized uh, network is uh, incredibly hard. And uh, we'll talk a lot about key management in the next lecture and the lecture after, and so that will be more clear. But really, the reason is that there's like no central authority to basically authenticate public keys. Uh, and even though there are all kinds of protocols at the, even for the core of the network to uh, do stronger versions of uh, IP, uh, they haven't really gotten uh, wide adoption uh, because of the sort of the key and management issue. And so basically what that has meant is that the, the focus for the core is on liveness and just ensuring that packets you know, get from A to C uh, from or from C to a client, or from sorry, from a client to a server, uh, with you know quite uh, with high probability, and and so the main uh, things that the, the main attacks that the internet, the core of the internet, actually has to protect against are you know these denial service type of attacks, you know, which we, we we talked about quite a quite a few of them, uh, and and the core itself doesn't provide uh, any strong authentication, and in particular, you know, you cannot trust you know the uh, source address in an IP packet uh, that it actually uh, that it is authenticated. And if you want you know, strong authentication or strong confidentiality, uh, you need you know basically to use sort of higher level protocols. And, and these higher level protocols uh, that run between the end nodes you know, provide this much you know, stronger authentication in a way that actually is meaningful to applications. And you know the first one of the first versions of these protocols that we'll be looking at, and one is the one probably most used in the internet. You know, you probably use it every day, uh, is SSL uh, or TLS, as it sometimes is called now. And that will be the topic of uh, Monday's lecture. And we'll see here how cryptographic you know, techniques can be used to strengthen uh, protocols to provide authenticity and uh, of addresses and uh, how to provide confidentiality. So with that, I want to end our first Zoom lecture. And uh, again, offer you the opportunity to ask questions. Uh, if you're, uh, if everything is clear, you know, feel free to sign off and uh, I'll see you on Monday. If you uh, want to ask questions, uh, I'll be hanging around for a little while and then, uh, uh, and, uh, you can ask questions. Is there, do I see a raised hand or is that another symbol? Anybody, any questions? Uh, I have a question. Do you mind going through the, uh, um, SYN cookies, just like a brief run through one more time. Yeah, sure. So uh, this board. Yes. Okay, good. Um, okay, so let, uh, so the the. Actually, hold on a second. Just me. What does SYN stand for here? Sin. Uh, this is actually one of the TCP packets. So when you open a, a TCP packet, the first packet you send is a, what's called a SYN packet. Uh, and that's the, it's just like an opcode of the packet to indicate what kind of packet it is. And so every TCP connection is opened first with uh, a SYN packet. And in the packet that goes from the, hold on, sorry. In the, in the packet that goes from the uh, client, you know, to the server, uh, 
uh, you know, the first packet is a SYN packet and that actually has the sequence number that the client picks and then the server also responds with a SYN ACK packet. Uh, or actually, sorry, that's the wrong one. Uh, the server normally responds with a SYN ACK packet, uh, but in the SYN flooding attack, what actually happens, the attacker uh, receives that SYN ACK packet, but then doesn't respond or doesn't acknowledge the SYN ACK packet. Instead, it sends another SYN packet to open a new TCP connection. And so the, the, the problem here is correct that the server is going to run out of uh, control blocks uh, that maintain state you know, for that particular TCP connection. And so the goal of the SYN cookies is to uh, set it up in a way that the server doesn't have to maintain state from the first to the third packet. Uh, and so the third packet, correct, is the actual packet where the client sends data. Uh, and so presumably once the client, uh, the client actually sends data, it's assumed that this is not a SYN flooding attack anymore. And we're talking to, a, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're communicating with a real client. And in fact, now, for example, stronger authentication, pro, uh, authentication can be uh, applied at the higher level. And so the main, uh, trick or the main uh, weakness in the handshake protocol is really that second message uh, and avoiding that the server maintains state at that for that second message or for basically the secret and the, the state that needs to be maintained is the sequence number of the client because that's going to be sitting in that third message and that's being used to basically see if that third uh, message is a duplicate or an, uh, an, uh, an acknowledgement of that second message. And so the way, uh, so, so the main state that the server needs to maintain is that uh, sequence number S and C, or that needs to remember. And instead of remembering it, what it does, uh, it encodes that sequence number C into the sequence number that it picks and it sends it back to the client. And the client will echo that back later, you know, back to the server. And so what you can think about is that the connection state, uh, instead of being stored in memory at the server, it's basically stored in the packet that goes through the client and then come back from the client to the server. And so, and the way that is done is to encode into the sequence number S uh, the following information. Uh, basically, the way that sequence number is constructed is a timestamp. And the timestamp is there to, uh, uh, so that the, an attacker that gets a copy of this particular uh, information or uh, can't replay that, you know, copy like a day later. Um, so the time is there. And then uh, the rest of it is almost identical to the sequence number piece, except, you know, the timestamp is also in the SHA-1. Uh, and the reason that the timestamp is in the SHA-1 is so that we can authenticate uh, the timestamp, you know, when the third message actually comes back. And so when the third message comes back, you know, we'll have a sequence number C plus one plus S and S. Um, and that SNS, correct, is the uh, SNS that was constructed in the, this message. And so what the server can do, since the server knows the secret, it knows the timestamp that it has been using, it can recompute SNS. If SNS is the same as the SNS that it got back from the client, it knows that that actually state is legit and that the sequence number uh, that it can, and, and it knows the sequence number that the client is being using CNNC is, pro, is legit and can then use that to initialize its uh, TCP control state. Awesome, thanks. Good. Any more questions? Feel free to ask as much as you like. No further questions on any topic. I don't really know how any of it works, but um, with Tesla and like Elon Musk talking about setting up satellite internet and Wi-Fi and stuff like that, um, would they use the same protocols as like the Ethernet wired protocol or um, would it be different? Uh, yeah, so I guess uh, I, I don't know if you're taking uh, uh, 602 or anything like that. So basically, uh, the way the network works, correct, is there's a layer of uh, protocols 
Um, and, you know, mostly we've been talking about, so at the bottom, let me actually draw a picture to make that a little more clear. There's sort of the physical layer. And you think about this as a Wi-Fi, uh, Ethernet, or anything like that. And basically, that's sort of an individual link. And on top of that, basically, you know, we run IP. Uh, and top of that, you know, we run, you know, TCP. And top of that, you know, we might run whatever, SSH. Uh, and uh, what, you know, when people talk about providing, uh, you know, for example, cellular services, they're basically talking about providing another uh, physical layer uh, that now in principle can be hooked into the internet. Uh, and in fact, in many ways, this is sort of the power of the internet. Uh, often we people draw, you know, the internet is as follows as a hourglass model where basically we have, you know, protocols on top like you know, TCP and many others. And then we have basically very narrow waste, which is the IP protocol, which is really simple. And then we have a lot of different protocols in below, below it, which are all the, the sort of different types of physical you know, network connections that people have. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay, should we stop the class at this point? Raise your hand if you have a question or uh, we're ready to stop this Zoom session. Okay, it sounds like everybody's sort of signing off. Uh, and I'm gonna stop the, the meeting. And uh, if we still is there, hope you're doing well and see you on Monday.